tonight. We're going to, we're just going to cover the first couple of verses, but I want to get an introduction to First Peter, the First Peter. Now we know Peter, we know Peter from the gospel. We know Peter as the as the one who is always sticking his foot in his mouth. Uh, uh, but it's uh, it's interesting to look at this writing of Peter's. Uh, he, he starts off in verse 1, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, Peter. It's interesting, he's the only Peter in the Bible. And so there have been some folks who question whether or not Peter actually wrote First Peter. Uh, no doubt in my mind, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I do want to point out a couple of things that confirm it. One reason why they, they think that Peter might not have written it one of the reasons is the fact that the Greek in it is, is very sophisticated. It's, it's very uh, sophisticated vocabulary. It's superb literature style. And Peter was always known as that dumb fisherman. I mean, uh, uh, look over in, um, let me get my notes here. Uh, over in Acts 4, verse 13, talking about Peter and John. They're standing before the Sanhedrin. And it says, Now they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. You know, Peter, a lot of change in Peter, you know, especially after the resurrection. And you know, we got to remember, and the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost came down, and, and Peter preached that first day, and 3,000 people, was it 3,000 or 5,000? I forget. At any rate, a whole bunch of people came to the Lord that first day of preaching. And we look at the Greek here, and obviously, uh, this is probably written close to 30 years after Pentecost. I'll talk about dates here in a second. But, you know, Peter been around, he traveled, he, he, he knew the Greek. He was probably uh, trilingual, if you will. And, and a lot of Jews in that day were, of course, they spoke Hebrew. And Hebrew was the language of religion. But what was the everyday language in Palestine was probably Aramaic. And then the international language was Koine Greek, was speaking Greek. And so he'd become pretty versed in Greek. Uh, not only that, he might have had somebody help him write it. It's kind of like Paul. Paul had folks that helped do the, his writing. Uh, Greek probably had Slyus. Uh, we read about him. Uh, 1 Peter 5, verse 12 says, Though uh, Silvanus, or Slyus, uh, that we read about, that was with Paul, he says, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Uh, so he talks and reference him. So he may have had some help in writing some of this, but this is definitely all Peter. All Peter. Now, you've got to remember, Peter was not his original name. What was Peter's name? Simon. We hear him call Simon Peter. And, 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 and when he ran into Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus said, uh, I've got to remember, who, who introduced Peter to Jesus? Huh? Andrew. Andrew. And, and John chapter 1, verse 42, and it says, he, that is Andrew, brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, Cephas, which translated Peter. Cephas is Aramaic, Peter is Greek. And so we know him as Peter. And Peter just simply became his name. Jesus renamed him. And, and so, uh, do you remember what Peter, uh, what, what, what the word Peter means? It means? It means a rock or a stone. And remember, Jesus says, this is upon this rock, not talking about Peter. You know, he says, uh, Peter, you're a pebble, but on this rock, that was his confession, that Jesus is, uh, is the one sent from God. It says, on this rock, I will build my church. 
over in uh, uh, Matthew 16. But, but Peter here, he, uh, uh, he's probably become very sophisticated, or let's say they're very converse in Greek, uh, an accomplished preacher and everything else. He's, a diff- he's not the man that used to fish around Galilee. And certainly after 30 years, uh, this was probably written uh, somewhere around 62, perhaps as late as uh, uh, 64, 65 uh, AD. And Peter, uh, according to church uh, tradition, was martyred uh, around 67. This was right at, at the time when Nero was starting to do his persecution of Christians. And so we... We understand that persecution was going on, and this is this is uh, the kind of uh, the mindset that we want to look at uh, the environment that Peter was writing this letter. But it's interesting uh, to look at uh, to look at the writings of Peter here, and uh, and and the parallels between uh, what he writes here in the sermons that he preaches over in Acts. Now, one I want to reference, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's interesting to look at. Uh, Jesus preached about, um, about the, uh, that he was the stone that the builders rejected. Remember that? Jesus preached that. They're, they're actually quoting from Psalms 118, verse 22, which reads, The stone which the builders rejected, he has become the chief cornerstone. Uh, Jesus preached on that. Uh, Matthew 21, verse 42, and you've got to remember, Peter was present. And it says, Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scripture, in, in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So he's quoting from the Psalms here. And then here in, in Peter, 1 Peter 2, verses uh, 7 and 8, Peter repeats it again. He, he, he re, tends to repeat some of the sermons from Jesus that he has heard. And we see these, we see these same sermons, especially over in uh, Acts uh, uh, chapter 4. Uh, he repeats it. But over here in Peter, 1 Peter 2, verses 7 and 8, he says, This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected. This became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word and to this doom they were appointed. And and obviously we're going to cover this later, but uh, it's interesting to see how these tie together. Also, another thing that's interesting in Peter, and this just simply confirms his authorship, it's interesting Peter's use of the word shepherd, shepherd, shepherd in terms of leading people. Now, over in um, uh, over in First uh, Peter five verse two, uh, he's given instructions. Peter's given instructions to the elders, and, and he's telling the elders. He says, "Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but voluntarily." voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sore gain, but with eagerness. Shepherd the flock of God. It's interesting, talking about shepherding people uh, is only used one other time in the New Testament, talking about being a shepherd. And that was when Jesus was restoring Peter. Remember, after the resurrection... Remember, Jesus had, uh, uh, Peter had denied Jesus three times. After the resurrection, they're around the Sea of Galilee. They're out fishing, and they haul in this load of fish. And, and, and then Jesus comes up to Peter, and he says, Peter, do you love me? And three times. And, and, and in verse uh, 20, uh, chapter 21 of John, verse 16, it says, He said to him a second time, Peter, son of, son, uh, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He, that is Peter, said to him, Jesus, he says, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He, Jesus, said to Peter, said to him, Shepherd my sheep. So it's interesting that he would use these words, shepherd, the shepherd, which it's interesting, It's uh, and we'll talk about it as we get to it, 
But uh, you, you know what the word, the, the noun shepherd is in Latin? Pastor. Pastor. That's where we get our word pastor from. Pastor means to shepherd or to be the shepherd to the flock. And so uh, here again, we're going we're gonna to take that verse apart once, once we get to it. But it's interesting that, uh, uh, that Peter would use this. Um, Peter, First Peter, it's addressed to the dispersed Jews, the Christians. Um, in fact, let's go back and look at verse 1. Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, identifying himself to those who resides as aliens scattered through Pontus, Galatia, uh, Cappadocia, Asia, and Blithnia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, he is writing to the scattered folks, mostly, uh, and these areas were provinces of Rome, mostly in Asia Minor, what we would call northern Turkey today. Now, remember I said this was probably written 64, 65. The uh, persecution of Christians from Nero was really starting to ramp up. Uh, they were, and it's interesting when we consider the persecution, because he's also in here, he says, you know, pray for the king and, and honor those in authority over you and so on and so forth, but uh, which we'll get to later. But uh, uh, he, as he's talking here, this speaks volumes to where we're going to be going in this uh, little epistle. He says that those who reside as aliens scattered throughout the area. Aliens, if you're, uh, uh, in some of your translations, it may have the word pilgrims or sojourners, exiles. Understand, he is writing to the church. He's writing to a church that is, um, that is being persecuted. He is writing... He is, he, he is writing to those who are called, and we're getting down here, those that are chosen, those that are elect, according to the foreknowledge of God. He's talking to those that have been called from God. And what is our status on this earth, those of us who are called by God, uh, the elect? And I'll talk about that here more in a minute. Well, Paul tells us over in... Um, Philippians, he says, our citizenship is where? In heaven. If our citizenship is in heaven, we're just passing through. Amen. This, this world is not my home, and we're passing through. And he said, we're aliens, we're sojourners, we are pilgrims, we are passing through. And I think a problem we have with too many Christians are way too comfortable with where they're at and they're happy to be there and we need to understand this is not our home we are you, you see God's true people have no place of rest here on earth I mean I, I turn on the news and Ellen and I talk about this and I am just dis distressed every time I open the paper of course, I open our paper. Our local paper is so liberal; it just uh, eats me. And, and I, I look at I, I look at what goes around and what's going on right here in our own nation, and I am not at rest. And we talked about that in prayer time. God's people have no place of rest. And and what did we read as we were studying through the end of Second uh, Timothy? It says, those who desire to live godly will be persecuted, will be persecuted. And so this is who he's addressing. And these are people who are scattered, or he's, depending upon your translation, talk about the dispersia, uh, those that have been scattered, the Jews, and they understand that word. And why are they scattered all over? And a lot of these that are writing to had fled Rome. Why are they scattered? Because of persecution. Because of persecution. We got to understand uh, the role of persecution 
especially in that first century. How do you think the gospel got spread to the whole known world? If it weren't for persecution, they'd all be sitting in Jerusalem still. But persecution has its place. Huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we read over in Romans 8, 28, you know, all things work together for good. Not that everything is good. Persecution, bad. But God works it for good. He works it for good. So those that have been scattered uh, throughout the known world at that time, and he says, this is who he is addressing it to. Those who reside as aliens, as pilgrims, sojourners, exiles, depending upon your translation. And it says, who are chosen? A lot of your translations will talk about the elect. The elect. We, we have problems with that word a lot of times. And, 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 and we can't stop there. Those who are elected according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. When we talk about God's foreknowledge. And actually, in other places, we read that God had chosen. He had elected them even before time began. God knows who's going to be saved. And, and then we get into this stuff about predestination and all this other stuff. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. We get into uh, Calvinism, and I'm not going there. But we need to understand God's sovereignty in all of this. God's sovereignty. Did God choose who was going to be saved and not saved before the beginning of time? Uh, yes and no. I don't know. First of all, we have to realize that God is sovereign. God is God. And because God is God, God can do anything God wants to do. Think about that. And who am I to question God? Now, uh, what I... Uh, now... This is what Doug Fannin thinks, based upon my study of Scripture. I think God knows that doesn't mean that we, uh, we've lost responsibility in all of this. God knew what I would choose, okay? Uh, he also knows who wouldn't choose. But we live in the here and now. We don't live where God lives, where he's outside of time and space as we understand it, who understands and remember what Jesus said, I am the Alpha and Omega. We, we talked about that last Sunday. I'm the beginning and the end. He knows everything that's gone on and in between. And because he knows, we live in the here and now. And it's still our decision, okay? He just simply knows that decision. But at the same time, God, those who are chosen, and I can't get over that, those who are chosen, those who are elected. Understand, God chose us, and I, and I personalize this. God chose me, me not because of anything I bring to the table, not because of who I am. It's all about who he is. It's all about for his glory. It's in his grace that I was chosen. And, 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 and I have accepted that grace according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And so it's all about, it's all about God. We, 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 we forget about that our, our part in salvation is, is nothing. It's all about God. It's His salvation that He imparts to us. It is His grace that we accept by faith. How does that all work? You know, some days I think about that, and, and I come up with the conclusion that uh, I don't have a clue. I don't know how it all works, but it does. And we're the elect. God has imparted his salvation. I've accepted it, and I can't even come to it unless he drew me. You know, and, and we, we tie all of these things together. And, and so we come, we have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by, look at these next, this next line here. It says, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Only by the Spirit are we able to accept the grace that God imparts to us. 
only by the Spirit. It's only by the Spirit that that sanctifies us that we can even approach what is holy because there is nothing holy in and of me and in and of myself. There is nothing in me that allows me to approach the holy other than the fact that the sanctifying work of the Spirit that cleanses me. And we're not done with that. Not what done with that. And, 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 and it's because of that sanctifying work of the Spirit that we go on to the next phrase, and it says, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled it with his blood. Boy, there's a whole lot packed into that. Do you know we can't obey Jesus unless we've been sanctified and enabled by the Spirit? To obey him. And, and, and it reminds me of that song, I um, almost sang it tonight, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. You know, part of obedience is we learn to know him. Because once I obey, and I may not understand it, but I do these things out of obedience, the light bulb clicks on. I'm beginning to grasp all of this. I understand why he wants me to live the way he wants me to live. And, and, and I'm starting to get it figured out. I haven't gotten it figured out yet, but I'm getting there. And, and, and uh, to obey uh, Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. It's interesting, the sprinkling of blood is a very Old Testament image. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, if you get time, go back and read uh, Exodus 24, verses 3 through 8. In fact, let me read it. I've got it right here. It says, Moses came and recounted to, to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken we will do. Moses wrote down... All the words of the Lord. And he rose early the next morning, built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men and the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as a peace offering to the Lord. Moses took half the blood and put it in the basins, and the other half he sprink of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And then he took the book of the covenant, the stuff that he wrote down from the Lord, read it in the hearing of the people, and he said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do, we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. Understand there's a cleansing effect of the blood. And here we talk about the red heifer, and this is where he took the blood and he sprinkled the, uh, from that. And, and, and there was a sprinkling of the blood uh, on the uh, priests that were ordained for service. And, and, and when we look at that, uh, ordaining, what's the whole point of ordaining? We have been set apart for a reason. And so here we are, we've been enabled by the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. That means to be ordained, to be set apart for his purposes. And, and, and so he's talking to these folks, understand who we are. We're strangers in this land. We have been chosen by God. That reflects the back being chosen because God gave us citizenship elsewhere, not here. And so we're, we're passing through and, and because of his foreknowledge and we've been sanctified by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Now we're able to obey Jesus Christ and because we are sprinkled with his blood, we've been set apart, we have been sanctified, we've been made holy. I don't always act holy, but we've been made holy. We can approach God. And understand when we approach him, and, and remember when Jesus died on that cross, what happened in the temple? The, 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 uh, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. We can enter the holy of holies. We can approach God because we've been sprinkled with his blood. We've been made holy, and we have direct access to God. Whew. That's just in the first two verses. And he's just saying, hey... And so this is where he is going. 
as we look at as we look at this. Understand the book of First Peter, this letter of First Peter, is a handbook. It, 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 it it's a handbook for ambassadors. Think of it. We we've been called to be ambassadors. We're going to read that here later. Ambassadors in a foreign and hostile land. We are his ambassadors, and we live in a foreign and hostile land. And, and as ambassadors, we represent him. And, and it's written to Christians that are experiencing persecutions and trials. Interesting. Paul, he's, uh, I mean, excuse me, Peter, he's writing this. He's probably writing from Rome. But yet we look in here in uh, 1 Peter 5.13, he says, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends greeting, and so does my son Mark. So he's, he describes himself in Babylon, but he's most likely from Rome. And remember, Babylon uh, was that bad place where they were exiled to, and he's using that for a code word for Rome, so he doesn't necessarily identify himself or his location. But, you know, people can read between the lines here. You know, was he in actually Babylon? Most likely not. It's just when we look at the circumstances here. But here he is. He's experiencing persecution himself. How do we live under persecution? I think First and Second Peter is a very timely book for us to look at in the age in which we live and the things that I believe that we're going to experience in the not too distant future. And so we need to pay attention here. Uh, Peter has a lot to say here. And, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, we need to pay attention. And so I think this is going to be a good study, good study. So I will end in verse 2, and we will pick it up in verse 3 uh, next week, and, uh, and we'll continue. Any questions or comments before we close tonight? Uh, yes, sir. I could have said, feed my sheep. Yeah, I think so. I, I've got to look it up in here. But, uh, but, but, but he's talked about, or shepherd my people. But uh, second time, third time. But he understand where, where Peter probably got this thing about being a shepherd. And he's charging the elders of the church about being a shepherd. So, yeah. We go back and look at that, and there's a lot of parallels that we can compare. All right, anything else? He was used more in the ministry of the gospel in Malibu than he ever was at Ephesus. Well, he can argue that with Paul, but nevertheless. Well, but, Paul was a great apostle. Yeah. He, the but of the originals, yeah. That we know of. Uh, understand, all of them, all the apostles with the exception of John, were all, according to church tradition, have all were martyred, were killed for the faith. Yeah. Yep. Um, Sunday. Um, I, I've had to think about this. Ellen was asking the other day, you know, the, this Sunday is uh, July the 3rd, uh, day before the 4th of <coughs> oh, excuse me, the day before Independence Day and uh, about doing something patriotic. And, you know, as I've been thinking about that, uh, I'm starting a new sermon series this Sunday. And it's uh, Back to Basics, What Do We Believe? And, and I feel like one of the more patriotic things that I can do is calling us back to basics, calling us back and... This week, I'm talking about, do we believe in God? And, uh, you know, we've got a whole country that has turned their back upon God. And we wonder why we're in the mess that we're in. And so, huh? 
Well, it's a refresher course, but it's one that we all need, and uh, absolutely. But uh, uh, I've got this series planned out all the way till November, and it's just looking at different things. You know, we believe in God. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the only one way of salvation. We believe in the church. Church is important. We believe in the family. Understand the family is an attack. Uh, and, and I can go on and on from there, but this is where I'm going in the sermon series that starts this Sunday. So we'll hopefully we'll see you all Sunday. Let me go ahead and close this in a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and we thank you for this book of First Peter. And Lord, that we might learn from your word, that we might stand firm in your word, in this world that is diametrically opposed to your word and everything about you. But Lord, may we be stand, may we be counted. And Lord, we thank you for your choosing us to be in your elect. And Lord, may we live accordingly. And Lord, may we bring honor and glory to Jesus. Watch over us, protect us, guide us in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Have a great week. We'll see you Sunday.